Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's event to discuss the Pentagon's 2023 China Military Power Report. I'm Dave Shulman, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub, which devises allied solutions to the global challenges posed by China's rise, leveraging the Council's work on China across its 15 other programs and centers. We are pleased to co-host today's event with the Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, which works to develop sustainable, nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States and its allies and partners. A logistical note at the outset that we will be taking questions from our audience in person and online toward the end of our hour together, so please go to askac.org to insert your questions throughout the event. So for those of our audience who don't know, the Defense Department's annual China Military Report is mandated by Congress and lays out for all to read not only the Pentagon's authoritative assessments of key trends in the Chinese military's capabilities buildup and strategic aims, but also insights into how the Pentagon is viewing China's activities in the Indo-Pacific and beyond, and the related challenges in managing tense relations with Beijing, as well as what the Defense Department is prioritizing in its relations and approach to China. So it's an important document, and today we have uh, two d very distinguished experts from the Pentagon here to discuss the report with us and its implications. And we have a lot of questions to get to over the next hour. So now I'll hand it over to my co-moderator today, Whitney McNamara, to introduce herself and our distinguished guests. Thank you, Dave. Whitney McNamara, I'm a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and a vice president at Beacon Global Strategies. I'm honored to be able to introduce our distinguished speakers today. With us, we have Dr. Eli Ratner, who serves as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs. Prior to his confirmation, he was the director for DOD's China Task Force and a senior advisor on China to the Secretary of Defense. Uh, we also have Dr. Michael Chase, uh, who became the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for China in 2021 and recently assuming the responsibilities for Taiwan and Mongolia as well. He previously was a senior political scientist at RAND, focusing on Chinese military modernization, its approach to strategic deterrence, Taiwan's defense policy, uh, and Indo-Pacific security issues writ large. Thank you both for being here with us today. Uh, this report, if anyone has already taken a look at it, covers a lot of ground, so we'll just jump into some questions. And the first one is really just to help us level set. What is different from this year's report than last year's? What do you want to highlight at, at the top? Right. Well, I think what we tried to do with the report this year is really explain why the PRC is the department's pacing challenge. Uh, many of you may have read the National Defense Strategy, and that's how it characterizes China and its rapidly modernizing military. And what we've done with this report is try to explain why that's the case. We cover a lot of ground in the report. Some of what's new here, the PRC has conducted more than 280 coercive and risky intercepts uh, in the air domain against the U.S. and its allies and partners <laughs> over the past roughly two years. Uh, we devote some attention to that in the report. We also talk about the modernization of the PLA's strategic deterrence capabilities, including its nuclear force, as well as its space and cyber and electronic warfare capabilities. On the question of the nuclear force, we cover a very rapid expansion, modernization, and diversification of the PRC's nuclear force in the report. Uh, we estimate that the PRC had, as of May, more than 500 nuclear weapons in its arsenal and is building a larger force that will surpass 1,000 nuclear weapons in 2030. And we also discuss in the report some of the provocative activity that the PLA undertook around Taiwan uh, last summer, including missile overflights of Taiwan. Uh, as well as some of the actions that the PRC has taken since declaring a no-limits partnership with Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, I would just note that we cover in the report the lack of military-to-military -military communications with the PRC as well. Uh, although we do maintain working-level communications on a pretty routine basis, uh, we've seen, unfortunately, the PRC largely denying, canceling, or ignoring most of our requests for everything from routine annual dialogues to senior leader engagements. And while the working level communications are an important component of a defense relationship, we really want to see it restart across the board so that we could have the senior leader communications as well uh, and the, uh, the normal annual dialogues that we would uh, expect to see take place. So we want to see this happening at multiple levels. And uh, that's one of the other things that I think is noteworthy in the report is just uh, it chronicles how challenging that's been uh, over the past year. 
maybe just maybe I'll just say at the outset here, uh, if we're talking about 2022 and, and what's new, uh, not not out of the PLA, and obviously we'll we'll spend the bulk of the hour talking about the PLA today. But it's notable that in 2022 as well, we released the national defense strategy that, as Mike said, identified the PRC as the department's top pacing challenge. Uh, we've put together a budget request that reflects that strategy as as never before. Uh, so I just want to make sure that as folks are, as we're getting into this discussion today about the PLA and its growing capability, we're not losing sight of the fact that uh, the department has identified uh, China as the top pacing challenge. We're investing <coughs> focused capabilities on solving operational problems associated with that. We're developing new operational concepts, <coughs> excuse me, as well. Um, we're deepening our relationships with our allies and partners. We're modernizing our force posture. So there's a whole lot that's going on uh, as it relates to these capabilities and, and where we think we are today, as you hear uh, department leaders saying, is that we believe uh, deterrence is real and, and deterrence is strong, uh, and we're working every day to keep it that way. That's really helpful, and all the topics you just covered are things we're gonna dive into. Um, I think one of the things we wanted to raise, despite China being the pacing threat, is that there is a cutoff time, right? The, these reports require lots of experts collating insights uh, and getting a consensus and then there's a cutoff time to publish and then geopolitical events inevitably happen despite China being the pacing threat. Is there anything you would have done differently or included in, in between the time of the cutoff and the actual publication of the report? So I would say, I, I guess I would characterize these maybe as things that we'll explore in greater depth next year because I think they're all topics that are touched upon in the report to some extent. But uh, one that I would highlight for further exploration in next year's report is the uh, corruption and the anti-corruption campaign. Uh, in the PLA, and in particular, what PRC leaders might think about the implications for the PLA's ability to achieve the goals that Xi Jinping has set out for them for 2027 and beyond. Uh, I think we would probably also cover in a little bit more uh, detail some of the uh, questions around strategic stability and risk reduction. Mm -hmm. uh, we do note in the report that the PRC appears interested in developing a conventional intercontinental range missile. And so I think that highlights uh, why that's another area that is worthy of our attention uh, and one that it would be good to be able to talk to them about directly if they were willing to engage in those conversations with us. Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways, Whitney, you're making the exact right point, which is these things are evolving. There has to be a cutoff point. I think a number of the issues, not so much issues that uh, maybe would be foreign to a reader of these reports, that issue, but issues that will likely be evolving in the coming months uh, and years. And I think Mike uh, laid down a couple of those, which absolutely we'll keep an eye on. I think the corruption issue is an important issue that a number of folks thought that uh, perhaps Xi Jinping had handled and had been put to bed. I would be interested in Dave's view on this issue. I know he's looked at this issue as well. Uh, but uh, clearly, it has reemerged as a significant endemic problem inside the PLA, and I think it'll be interesting to see how that evolves uh, in the coming months, including how it's affecting their own perceptions of uh, capabilities, but also uh, other modernization efforts and, and the institution overall. So I think that's a evolving issue. I think the question of uh, PLA, PLA overseas facilities and mm -hmm. basing, this is something the China Military Power Report has been talking about for years, uh, identifying some of the places in particular where the PRC remains interested. We continue to see that. We continue to see them now uh, working more with domestic security forces as an alternative way to make inroads uh, with some of these regimes, particularly non-democratic regimes. So that's an area we'll want to keep an eye on. Uh, and then the mill-mill uh, area as well, I think, remains quite fluid. We've seen a lot of diplomacy uh, between the United States and China over the last several months, and I think our uh, hope would be that given the importance we see in the mill-mill relationship, that that will be an area by the time we're sitting on stage next year will have evolved uh, further. So we'll be keeping an eye on that and, and uh, happy to talk about that in more detail as well. Well, I want to, I was going to ask a different question, but you touched on something I wanted to sure. touch on. So let's, let's dig into the PLA's global ambitions and potential for more military facilities and basing around the world, not just in the Indo-Pacific, but the report lays out potentially also in the Middle East and in Africa and other places. So I'm uh, just curious if there's more to say on, you know, how you're thinking about what this means in terms of, you know, the PRC's strategy globally, 
what is most concerning uh, for the department, for the administration when we think about where China might be looking at facilities and basing? And then what's the approach that the U.S. government and, and the department in particular would take in terms of engaging with countries that might be considering um, having a Chinese base or, or a, a military facility on their soil? And how do you kind of navigate what could be a fairly tricky set of conversations? Do you want to take that one first? Sure. Yeah, I'll start on that one first. So I think we've seen the PLA pursuing a network of overseas installations now really dating back probably to the, uh, I would say the early 2000s was when I, I think they began having a debate about how they would protect their security interests globally. And then, of course, the establishment of the first overseas base in Djibouti mm -hmm. uh, broke a precedent that uh, they had previously uh, refrained from having overseas military installations uh, or certainly overseas military bases. And what we've seen since then is PLA uh, strategists talking increasingly openly about the fact that Djibouti is their first but won't be their last overseas base. And so we have uh, seen the PLA continue to pursue different types of facilities, uh, some that uh, might be um, more relevant to their space program, others that are potentially for logistics support, and we'll probably see pursuit of additional facilities that are more full-scale bases like the one in Djibouti. And in the report, we highlight uh, Reem Naval Base in Cambodia uh, as uh, one where there are developments unfolding right now. And then uh, looking to the future, we also talk about a number of locations in the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, on the west coast of Africa, and in, uh, in other locations as well. So I think we expect to see the PRC continue to pursue that global network of bases. And it will definitely present some challenges to the US and to our allies and partners. Um, and uh, I think uh, as we see that develop, Obviously, it creates the potential for some friction in their relationships with the host countries as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily the case that they uh, identify someplace, pursue it, and everything uh, goes smoothly and goes the way they want it to. Uh, just like any other power that's seeking overseas bases, they'll run into a variety of challenges in trying to accomplish those objectives. And, and I would just add three quick, quick points to that one. I think first, Dave, yes, uh, your question about engaging with potential host countries, that's part of this. The other part of it is, of course, engaging with other countries who may have an interest, yep. whether it's in the region or elsewhere, right. uh, associated with their security interests in this type of uh, overseas PLA presence. So we've been engaging with relevant allies and partners on these issues as well, which has been important. Uh, we've been uh, second working uh, from an interagency perspective on this. This is not just a DOD mm -hmm. concern or just a uh, military security issue. It has other equities, too. So this has been a whole of government conversation in a, in a very effective way. Uh, and I think third, um, you know, it's important to do this in a disciplined way, too. And for those of us who have been working on the China problem for a long time, yes, their influence is growing. Yes, the PLA has a more global foot footprint. Uh, but the most important thing is really trying to understand where does that really matter for right. U.S. national interest and doing that in a disciplined way and not just chasing uh, PLA presence where we see it, but understanding specifically what are our interests and where and, and protecting them commensurate with that kind of focus and resources. Yeah, that's a really important point. Basically, you know, you can't cover the entire world if you're covering everything, you're covering nothing. So how do you focus and how do you strategize? So um, appreciate your saying that. I want to come back to um, what was already mentioned in terms of a big focus for the report, which is the PLA's increasingly risky and coercive behavior. Um, maybe on the risky part, just you know, ask if there's anything else to say on you know, what you think strategically is driving that, especially in terms of the air intercepts and these kinds of things, which we'll be seeing, we've been seeing, and obviously very dangerous. You know, is there a strategic drive behind what, what the PRC is doing there? So that's, that's one question. But more broadly on the coercion piece, I think that the report is really strong in talking about how the PRC is using the PLA increasingly as an agent of statecraft, including in the coercive space, especially against our Indo-Pacific partners and allies. We had an example of that just this weekend, right, with the uh, Chinese vessels um, uh, colliding with, with Philippine vessels in the South China Sea. Um, but so I, I want to get a little bit, you know, more granularity on, on what you think is, you know, are, are in the key, you know, arsenal of things that the PRC is using in terms of coercion, but specifically on Taiwan where, of course, we've seen you know, more um, military flights uh, close, to, close to Taiwan, uh, overflights, these kinds of things, missile overflights. Um, and we're heading towards this election, presidential election, in January in Taiwan. Um, so any thoughts you might have on what, what's most concerning to you in terms of what we've seen in terms of China's coercion against Taiwan, and what you, know, you can suspect might you know, play out over the next six to nine months 
as we lead towards that election in January and then go towards the inauguration of whoever wins in May. So maybe I'll start just on the, on the um, operational behavior question and then maybe Mike can build on some of the Taiwan points. As, as you all may have seen, last week, uh, Admiral Aquilino and I uh, did a presentation before the Pentagon Press Corps and the Defense Department put out a press release uh, describing a series of events, specifically uh, air events, air intercepts against U.S. aircraft operating uh, in international airspace according to international law in both the South China Sea and the East China Sea. And this was a variety of different behaviors. It was air intercepts that were coming in too fast, that got too close, that brandished weapons, that engaged in risky and dangerous maneuvers around U.S. aircraft um, that we think is important to be highlighting um, because they really are dangerous. They, they put lives at risk and they risk also uh, potential crises that could lead to uh, inadvertent conflict. So it's a really uh, important issue. I think the one of the important insights from the report, uh, from the China Military Power Report that I cited in that press conference is that we do believe that this is a coordinated campaign by the PLA. This is not a set of individual rogue pilots doing this. And we have various reasons uh, to believe that, including just the pattern of behavior, which has been uh, relatively constant uh, and quite worrisome. And, and obviously, you ought to ask the PLA specifically what their intentions are. But I think broadly, we understand that uh, they have ambitions to drive the United States out of the region. Mm -hmm. uh, they have an interest in driving uh, wedges between the United States and our allies and partners. I should add that this behavior is also occurring against not just the United States, so that was the highlight of this particular, uh, the focus of this particular release, but also against uh, other allies and partners. We've seen the Canadian government about, out talking about this. The Australians experienced a very dangerous incident in the South China Sea last year where one of their jet engines ingested chaff in the South China Sea. So there's a pattern of behavior here against uh, lawful uh, behavior. In the case of the Canadians, uh, this behavior has occurred well. Uh, those Canadian aircraft are actually implementing UN Security Council resolutions that the PRC voted for uh, enforcing DPRK uh, sanctions against the DPRK. So uh, this is counter-normative behavior. Uh, it is against the uh, trying to interfere with lawful behavior, and I think it's part and parcel of a broader effort by the PRC to refashion uh, the Indo-Pacific region away from the kind of free and open Indo-Pacific that we're trying to build. Yeah, I think what I would add to that is that it also illustrates the importance of resuming the normal military to military channels of communication uh, because we should be meeting to talk with the PLA and what's called the MMCA uh, at, at, at the operator to operator level to talk about ensuring that air and maritime counters are safe and professional. Uh, that both sides uh, should know that that's a predictable outcome when they're operating in close proximity. But the PLA has declined to hold those talks with us now for a couple of years. So that's something that we would very much like to get back on the calendar. We don't want to have a repeat of the uh, aircraft collision incident that occurred in 2001. Uh, but the behavior the PLA is engaging in increases the risk that that's going to happen either with the United States or the Australians or the Canadians or, or potentially with another country. And so again, I think that just underscores the importance of the PRC resuming those normal military communications with us as soon as possible. Um, on Taiwan, uh, you highlighted some of the operational behavior that the PLA is conducting around Taiwan, which appears to be intended to intimidate uh, people on Taiwan. And so that includes crossing the Taiwan Strait Center Line routinely. That was something that until relatively uh, recently was reserved for occasional signaling purposes. Now it's something that the PRC does increasingly on a routine basis as well as the large numbers of uh, aircraft entering Taiwan's air defense identification zone and some of the naval operations around Taiwan. Uh, we also talked about some of the periods when the PRC has mounted more uh, higher intensity coercive activities around Taiwan, uh, such as following then Speaker Pelosi's visit when they launched missiles over Taiwan, uh, and also in response to President Tsai's transit visit of the US. So we have definitely seen the PRC leaning on the PLA as more of an instrument uh, for its coercive activities uh, aimed at Taiwan, in addition to some of the other things that they've traditionally done, trying to reduce Taiwan's number of diplomatic allies, uh, putting some economic pressure uh, in a, a, a way against uh, different parts of uh, Taiwan's economy, and, and then the kind of information activities that they've conducted also. 
uh, sort of psychological operations that they've uh, mounted against Taiwan, um, which the, the PLA refers to as cognitive domain warfare in, uh, in some of their own professional military publications. So uh, those are all illustrations of the kinds of activities we've seen aimed at pressuring and, uh, and coercing Taiwan uh, that are covered in the report. And I would just say, I mean, I think this is evident, obviously, to folks sitting on the stage and maybe a lot of people in the room here, but Dave, what you opened your question with, the point of we see the PLA playing a more prominent role in PRC statecraft, mm -hmm. and, and the report has said that over the last couple of years, but it is a really important change in Chinese foreign policy. And if you went back a decade ago, 15 years ago, folks would say, yeah, you know, the PLA is modernizing, we see that, but it's way in the background, and the PRC is leading with investment and economics uh, in diplomacy, and the military and the PLA are not a central instrument of their foreign policy and their strategy, and that has changed, and that's really important. And so that is, I think, uh, amid sort of the details here, that's one of the key findings of this report over the last couple of years. Absolutely. Yep. I think a lot of folks have pointed to China's waning economic growth and their domestic demographic challenges. You guys mentioned chronic corruption um, as sort of a sign that the PRC might not be as strong as a competitor as we imagine in the next few years. But as you know, uh, a weaker Beijing might be more isolationist or they might be more hostile. So how do you see these sort of domestic trends um, shaping China's pattern of coercion, especially in light of these recent trends of the PLA playing a much bigger role in foreign policy? Sure. Um, I guess I would start on that one um, by noting that it's something I think we've tracked or the report's been coming out for more than 20 years now. And so uh, there's a baseline there and, and uh, readers can look and see how it's evolved over time. And you know, as you just heard, the PRC is leaning on the PLA much more as an instrument of advancing its foreign policy objectives. I don't think that that will necessarily uh, change one way or the other as a result of uh, economic slowdown or other internal pressures. I think that's a decision that they've made that this is an instrument that they can use to advance their goals alongside the economic and diplomatic and information uh, tools that they have available in their toolkit. And they've decided to rely on the PLA more heavily uh, in those areas where it's applicable for them. Um, I do think one of the interesting things to look for maybe in future reports is whether a slowing economy imposes some trade-offs uh, between different projects that are important components of PLA modernization. Uh, they are getting into areas that are more expensive, more uh, technologically complex. The large-scale expansion of the nuclear force, the aircraft carrier program, and the pursuit of the global network of installations for the PLA, among others, uh, stealth bombers, other things that we talk about in the report. And so I do think that that's another area to watch is whether uh, not necessarily it changes the importance that they're attaching to using the PLA as a tool of foreign policy, uh, advancing their foreign policy goals, but rather whether some trade-offs are uh, inevitably going to have to be made in terms of some of the big ticket programs that the PLA has embarked on. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think we may be seeing some of those trade-offs already. And um, we have seen, for instance, over the last couple of years, uh, Belt and Road investments by the PRC dropping dramatically around the world is something that, again, a decade ago when it was launched was one of the tip top priorities uh, for the leadership in Beijing. And now because of their economic slowdown, you see them uh, less able and less willing uh, to be supporting those kind of investments overseas. So even things that are high pri priorities are getting uh, cut in the face of this economic slowdown and uh, the PLA uh, will be no different over time. Uh, I think the other thing to keep an eye on is also how uh, these changes or the changes in China's uh, economic trajectory affect the decision making of the rest of the countries in the region and around the world because we have seen uh, the PRC predicate their uh, security behavior also around the assumption that they are the economic juggernaut of the future and the way countries were making decisions about uh, the ways in which they challenged PRC coercion, the ways in which they aligned with each other or took the PRC on uh, on various issues was based upon, again, this perception of uh, what we thought was China's rise that clearly is not the picture we're likely to see into the future. So I think it's not just a question. It is an important question about how does this affect decisions within the PLA, but I think it's also for the region and, and for the world something absolutely to watch over the next uh, several years. It's a great segue into the next two questions, too, which is a lot of folks in the tech space are noting the billions that Beijing is funneling into modernization in terms of space and cyber domain, also the billions it's funneling into its own commercial sector uh, for tech modernization and tech self-sufficiency, 
And that, of course, has implications not only for Beijing's military performance, its ability to carry out sophisticated espionage, but also just its role, right, in the global tech competition. And so how did these factors sort of play into the report as you are sort of judging China's military power? So I think it's a, it's a big part of the overall strategic competition between the US and the PRC. I think the PRC very much sees it that way. We highlight in the report some of what uh, Xi Jinping and other leaders have said about strategic competition with the United States. And we note that earlier this year in March, he talked uh, openly and publicly about the US and its allies trying to suppress, encircle, and contain the PRC. And I think that this is uh, undoubtedly part of what they have in mind there. For their part, they're still pursuing uh, what we for years have known as a military civil fusion development strategy. They're not talking about it in those uh, exact words anymore, but they're still trying to do exactly the same thing. They've just changed the language that they use, I think, to maybe try to downplay it a little bit because of all the international attention and concern that it was receiving. Uh, but they're still very much trying to pursue that approach. And I would just say it's also obviously animating our own side of uh, thinking about the technology competition and what it means for the way that we're uh, shaping our own policy. We've seen as a result of some of the national security concerns, not entirely, but based on some of the national security concerns, the Biden administration making major investments here in the United States at home, the CHIPS Act uh, and other elements to ensure that uh, we are running as fast as we can uh, in terms of the technology race. So we have made those kind of investments. We have a number of new uh, not only dialogues, but uh, cooperative activities with, our, uh, with a number of allies and partners on technology issues. We have uh, launched one at the National Security Advisor level with India, which has been quite impactful with a, with a defense element. We recently launched another one uh, with Singapore, also hosted by both the National Security Advisor uh, and the Secretary of State and their Singaporean counterparts that also has a defense element to it. Uh, so lots of work with allies and partners in this regard. And then, of course, ensuring that uh, we're taking the steps we need to protect our own technology. You've seen a new executive order uh, putting restrictions on US outbound investment into the PRC, into areas in particular that have applicability to some of the capabilities that we're most worried about in this report. So as we are focused exactly, Whitney, on, on what you're describing, we're taking a number of steps uh, on the US side as it relates to the technology competition. And speaking of trade-offs, too, I mean, for you said in your opening remarks, Michael, that you know the military and intelligence communities have been warning for years uh, about coming nuclear parity. There's 500 operational warheads that Beijing has, probably a thousand come 2030. We also have uh, the you know in conjunction the report says that China's developing conventional ICBMs, which can reach the U.S. How should the U.S. think about their trade-offs in light of these developments when we also have to contend with our conventional modernization force structure and the emerging tech sort of spend that we just talked about? How should the U.S. government be thinking about it? Well, I think certainly we're going to continue to invest in a, a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent to make sure that extended deterrence uh, is credible. And we're going to invest also in the military technology of the future, the operational concepts to ensure that we'll be able to employ it effectively, maybe in ways that are unexpected, uh, maybe by uh, having new technologies that are unexpected or employing existing capabilities or some combination of new and existing ones in unanticipated ways. Um, and uh, of course, we're going to work closely with allies and partners on some of those initiatives. And then I think we're going to also have, we already are uh, moving in much uh, more in the direction of having a diversified posture in the region that's going to enable us to do uh, different things to, to deter or, uh, or respond to aggression. So. I think we've done a lot already. Um, there are some major investments uh, already uh, that have been made and that will be made in the future uh, to that end. But I think, uh, do you want to say a little bit more about no, that? No, I think that's, that's great. Yeah. Pass it over to you. OK. Uh, so I want to ask about the role of Russia. And Eli knew I would get to this, one of my favorite <laughs> subjects. Um, so the report states that uh, China views its partnership with Russia as integral to its development and emergence as a great power, which I think is absolutely right and certainly helps to explain China's support for, for Russia's war on Ukraine. Um, but can you talk a little bit about how the Pentagon's viewing the China-Russia military relationship at this point, the strategic partnership uh, more broadly, uh, and to what extent it complicates uh, DOD planning um, for you know, contingencies um, at the same time in the context of deterrence, contending with multiple theaters, both in the conventional and the strategic sense? Sure. I guess uh, what I would say about the military relationship is they've continued to do more exercises together, uh, more uh, activities like the joint bomber uh, exercises. 
Uh, it's something that they portray as a no limits partnership and I think they want to use the military exercises to signal the growing closeness of that relationship. Uh, at the same time, it's of course not really a completely unlimited partnership and I think we've seen that with respect to uh, China's support for uh, Russia's uh, aggression in Ukraine, mm -hmm. that they're balancing a perceived need to be supportive to Russia for the reasons that you just stated about the importance of their bilateral relationship, uh, also with some concern about the reputational costs and the other costs that they might incur uh, if they uh, went really uh, across the line in terms of the level of support they're providing to Russia. And so I think that's moderated uh, and, and been a factor in their calculations in terms of what they want to do. So um, I guess I would, I would highlight that while it's a critically important strategic relationship from the PRC's perspective, uh, it's also one that comes into some level of friction with some of their other interests in terms of maintaining productive relationships with the uh, European countries in particular, uh, as well as in other areas. And so I do think it has some constraints uh, that are part of it, notwithstanding the no limits label. Yeah, I mean, that, that was one of the points I was going to make. To the extent that the Russia-China relationship brings to bear the, the sort of uh, unity of the different theaters between Europe and the Indo-Pacific, the negative externalities of that relationship have actually come home to roost in Europe uh, before they have in the Indo-Pacific. And I think that has been a wake-up call for uh, European partners about the challenges that the PRC presents to them directly. Um, similarly, for uh, partners such as uh, Republic of Korea, Japan, they're now seeing uh, the potential threat of this kind of activity to their interests as well. So uh, I think the bottom line is this is not just a problem for the United States. It's a problem for Europe. It's a problem for our allies in Asia. Uh, and we're talking with them about this as well. Uh, and how we are thinking about responding is in a coordinated fashion with them as well. But Dave, let me ask you, if you were advising Secretary Austin and he asked you, you know, how should the Pentagon be thinking about this issue of the Russia-China relationship or why does it matter most for the Indo-Pacific? What would, what would your answer be? No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, it's clear that they're talking more across the board and including in terms of their military relationship and what they're potentially looking at in terms of uh, more cooperation on the strategic level, potentially even more, uh, you know, even in the offensive cyber domain. Some of these areas where in the past we'd say, okay, Russia would never go along with that, or there's too much distrust between the two of them. And I think now we're at a place where, especially if China were to ask, Russia's in no position to say no. And so I think looking at what that means for different contingencies that could be faced in the Indo-Pacific, and then obviously in multiple theaters, and we see what Russia's doing in, in Europe, this could be something that I think could be a real problem going forward. And I'm sure the, the Pentagon's thinking about that problem and how to game it out and prepare for it. Um, so my follow-up to that kind of is, uh, is related to what you just said, Mike, I think earlier on the diver diversified force posture um, and, and just general presence in the region. This has obviously been a top priority for the department, for the administration, working with the Philippines, working with Australia um, and many others and looking to have a presence that's more mobile and lethal and resilient uh, as, as you and others have put it. Um, at the rollout of this report last year with our friends at AEI, um, Eli, you said that 2023 was likely to stand as the most transformative year in U.S. force posture in the region in a generation. So we're pretty well through 2023. Do you, do you think it's going pretty well thus far? How's it going? Absolutely. I think I'm, I'm happy to report that I think we've delivered uh, on that promise. Um, absolutely. We, uh, between the work that we have done with our Japanese allies, uh, bringing forward the Marines' uh, most lethal and advanced capability in the Marine Littoral Regimen, uh, forward to Japan, uh, which should be in place within the next couple of years, hugely important uh, to maintain deterrence in the first island chain. We've uh, expanded the number of uh, uh, sites we have in the Philippines. These are Philippine bases, but places under a 2012 agreement to which the U.S. military has access uh, over the last year. Uh, this year, we added four new strategic sites uh, to the Philippines, three in northern Philippines, one uh, on the border of the South China Sea. Uh, heading down to Australia, uh, we have had uh, a remarkable year in terms of the agreements that we've put forward, uh, developing and advancing and diversifying our force posture in Australia, which is hugely important for our alliance mm -hmm. with Australia, really important for issues related to power projection uh, and logistics across all domains. Uh, with the Australians. Uh, and then we've been taking a number of other actions as well. Secretary Austin was the first U.S. Defense Secretary ever to visit Papua New Guinea. 
uh, just uh, within the last several months where we signed a new, uh, or in the wake of signing a new uh, defense cooperation agreement that will provide the United States uh, access to ports and airfields there. We recently, within the last couple of weeks, uh, had a team from Indo-PACOM down in PNG looking at some of those sites and thinking about some of the infrastructure investments that we'll be making down there. Uh, and all the while, throughout the region, have been engaging in a number of campaigning activities uh, that is also leading to this more diversified, uh, lethal, distributed, mobile force posture. I think of those uh, uh, items that I described earlier, whether it's Japan, uh, Philippines, Australia, any one of those would have made for a banner year and have, have been a historic announcement. The fact that we did them all at the same time, I think, has been a, a massive contribution to deterrence in the region. Uh, it's really important, and, and we're not done yet. We're going to keep moving. But I think, yeah, we're, we're proud of the year that we've had so far. Mentioning allies and partnerships as well, you know, Beijing is no doubt watching the Ukraine conflict closely, not only from a military dynamic perspective, but also to just the role of U.S. allies and partners have played uh, in countering Russian efforts. What do you think Beijing is taking away from watching uh, the Ukraine conflict, whether from a military perspective, an ally perspective, a diplomacy perspective? So I think that there are, of course, the PLA studies other countries' conflicts very closely in large part because they themselves haven't been involved in major combat operations since 1979. So I think they'll try to take away a lot of tactical, operational, <laughs> strategic lessons from the, from the war. But uh, at the broader diplomatic and economic and kind of grand strategy level, I think they're definitely going to look very closely at what you just described, which is the huge contribution that allies and partners have been making, uh, stepping up in support of Ukraine. And I think that the PRC will look closely uh, at that and uh, hopefully take away the lesson that the U.S. and its allies and partners uh, will work together very closely and can form a coalition that will be enduring and successful uh, where we need to. Uh, I think that they also will undoubtedly try to take measures to insulate themselves better, to mitigate the risks that they think they face, to be better prepared um, on their own end uh, based on what they've seen here. I, I think we can count on that. And I would say just, uh, you know, look, everybody's watching what's happening in Ukraine, drawing lessons. Of course, we are. There's a huge process inside the department to understand this. And, and from the operational perspective, it's quite important as it relates to a smaller military holding off uh, uh, a much stronger military. Um, so I think we're, we, we are uh, all watching this very closely, learning lessons. Uh, and, and what I will say is that there's been a lot of debate about <laughs> how is Beijing interpreting uh, what's happening in Europe. I think I would say confidently that what is happening in Ukraine uh, is reinforcing deterrence in the Indo-Pacific based on the information that we have. Great. You want to go to uh, our audience Shall we questions? go to questions? Okay. Um, so let's jump in. Um, we have uh, one question from the audience here from uh, the director of our Indo-Pacific Security Initiative, Marcus Skarlaskis. Um, and you've touched on this a little bit already, but I think um, this really, you know, nails down into the question of, you know, how um, are our friends in Taiwan and our allies in the region and around the world um, going, what do you really want them to focus in on or keep in mind as they read this report? Because we know they'll be reading it closely. Um, you know, what are the one or two things that you really think they should focus in on? Well, uh, I think different countries will probably focus on different aspects of the report, but I think one of the things that we want them to take away is an explanation of why we refer to the PRC as our pacing challenge, the areas in which we see them moving very rapidly to improve their capabilities. Uh, we also cover some of the areas in which they continue to assess that they have some shortcomings. I think it's important for our allies and partners to have a realistic understanding of uh, where the PLA has made rapid progress and, and where they still have what they would themselves characterize as some uh, vulnerabilities or shortcomings. Uh, I think it's also important for them to look closely at what we say about the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, about not only the mm -hmm. implications for the immediate area and for the Indo-Pacific, but the global economic implications that a crisis or conflict across the Taiwan Strait would have. Uh, that I think is one of the important uh, factors for, uh, for a number of our allies and partners to take into account uh, and for them to uh, also to think about what they can do to contribute to ensuring that the deterrence that we uh, that we have uh, across um, uh, the Taiwan Strait right now remains real and strong. That we do everything that we can to strengthen that uh, in the uh, in the coming years. There's a big role for uh, for others to play there as well, in part because of those those global implications. I think that's one of the important takeaways from the report. 
You know, it's interesting, just re reflecting on that question, I think um, there has been a time in which, if you, if you were wound back again, maybe five, 10 years ago, when a report like this would be really important to ensure that regional countries understood the kind of pressure and threat that the PLA may present in the future. I think what, what we have seen over the last couple years uh, is that a number of regional countries don't need to be told that they're experiencing this for themselves as a result of some of the operational activity that we were responding to earlier. And in fact, we're seeing them coming forward, wanting to invest more in themselves, wanting to work more with each other, looking to the United States to uh, strengthen our own presence and our, our own relationships and ties in the region. So of course, there is sort of an information dissemination part of this report, but the overriding strategic point of, I think we have a problem here with a, a major country in the region that, that is looking to revise the rules and norms, that that fact is actually relatively well understood. I think one takeaway that, that could be valuable here is a lot of countries are looking at, okay, well, what should we do about it from a military perspective? Because uh, they may not have the experience or necessarily the analytical capability that the United States has. So one thing that we have been doing really across the board with both high-end uh, and uh, less developed partners is helping them think through what are the types of, in particular, asymmetric capabilities and investments that would be useful for them to help them defend their own national interests, their own sovereignty, to counter the kind of coercion that they're hearing from the PRC. And I think this, this report really illuminates both the ways in which the PRC is engaging in that behavior, the types of capabilities that they're bringing to bear, but also, as Mike said, some of the vulnerabilities that they have that can be exploited with some of these asymmetric capabilities. It's a good segue into the next audience question, which is we talk a lot about it's an easy sell for the countries in China's near abroad to see their course of behavior. Uh, what about their broader influence in the global south? How successful do you think they've been uh, in sort of influencing the narrative there? Well, I think this has uh, been a focus for the PRC, uh, and you see in their diplomacy trying to uh, generate support for their broader vision for international politics, and uh, I think this remains uh, an open question about how successful they will be. I think we're cognizant of this, we're watching it closely, Clearly, uh, we are looking to work through major regional institutions and international institutions to keep a focus on approaching security issues through the lens of international law and then working with close allies and partners throughout the world on this issue. Um, well, I have another question here from the audience, from Alice. Um, specifically on elaborating on the future potential of the Quad, right, the quadrilateral security dialogue uh, and, its, and its deterrence capabilities. Well, maybe I'll, uh, I'll take that on and, and Mike may want to build on this. The, the Quad itself, which is the United States, uh, Australia, Japan, and India, uh, has not been predominantly focused on uh, defense issues or, or hard national security issues. It's been focused on delivering public goods throughout the region, whether that's related to global public health, infrastructure. Uh, it has done some important work on uh, maritime domain awareness. Uh, there's a particular initiative, the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative, the IPMDA, mm -hmm. which has come through the Quad uh, and is an effort to deliver uh, commercially provided unclassified satellite imagery uh, to a number of allies and partners throughout the region. Um, that's been really important, so we will continue working in that regard. Um, but what I would say, I think the, what you're identifying, Dave, I mean, we can d talk about the Quad in particular, but one of the important changes that we've seen in the emerging regional security architecture over the last couple of years is stronger and more minilateral mm -hmm. types of initiatives that are creating a multi-layered uh, security architecture in the region, really complementary with each other, not one meant to displace another. Of course, we do have elements of the Quad, we have AUKUS, we have a very robust trilateral set of arrangements and activities between the United States, Japan, and Australia. Uh, we have a, a number, particularly in the wake of the President's Camp David Summit with the ROK in Japan. We have uh, really invigorated the, that trilateral defense relationship. Uh, the Philippines is engaging in more of these activities as well. Um, and we see partners, importantly, starting to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, engage more with each other. Uh, and that redounds absolutely to the benefit of regional security and 
to our alliances and partnerships. Just to give you one example, we recently saw uh, Australia and Japan sign a reciprocal access agreement. And what that allows is exactly what it sounds like, which is now they, their forces are able to uh, operate and have access to each other's facilities. We've seen it in the wake of that, which was only signed just recently, um, F-35s from Japan travel to Australia, and then vice versa, uh, Australian uh, F-35s traveling to uh, Japan. Uh, and then uh, an agreement between the three of our countries to integrate Japanese F-35s into US force posture initiatives in Northern Australia. So you can start to see uh, these different pieces coming together, and again, a way I think is, is emergent, uh, but uh, really, really beneficial to deterrence in the region. We have a question from Byron. Is there any indication that China may be more concerned about instability in Central Asia, given Russia's focus on Ukraine? And on the issue of China's slowing economy, have we seen any evidence that the PLA is adjusting its modernization plans in response to economic growth yet? So on the, on the second question, I think we're probably beginning to see some of that evidence, and I think we'll see more of it over time. And I think it's a function not only of the uh, slowing economy, but also of the nature of some of the programs that the PLA is pursuing. I mean, again, we have a roughly 20-year body of these reports now. And <clears throat> if you go back uh, 10 years ago or so, uh, you could see that the kinds of things that the PRC was pursuing have really evolved over this, this time span into some of the things that we highlight in this year's report, the third aircraft carrier uh, and, uh, being launched. And they're becoming increasingly technologically sophisticated and, you know, and therefore uh, increasingly pricey as well. Uh, so some of those challenges, I think, are inevitable uh, for, uh, for those uh, reasons. In terms of the, the part of the question about uh, security in Central Asia, I think the PRC remains strongly concerned about uh, all of the areas along its borders and areas where uh, they perceive also potentially a threat that could implicate domestic stability concerns that they have. Uh, and uh, I, I think that they don't want to see Russia uh, sort of severely diminished as a result of the conflict in Ukraine because of the importance that they see uh, for Russia as a security partner. Uh, although, as you pointed out earlier, David, that uh, to the degree that Russia becomes more reliant, it might give them more leverage to gain some concessions or some additional forms of cooperation that haven't been forthcoming in the past. So there may be a little bit of a, sort of two sides of that coin there. Great. Um, we have a question here that's spe fairly specific, but I'll broaden it out a little bit. So the question is, and this is from Don, um, can you confirm that the Pentagon has received and accepted an invitation to attend the Shangshan Forum, uh, which, which the Chinese are going to host uh, next week or this week, um, I think next week, um, and uh, who will participate in it, and can we expect more military context in the, in the coming weeks? And I think the broader question is, you know, you've already talked about the importance of the mill-to-mill -mill dialogue and relationship. Is there any hope that with, hopefully, uh, a new defense minister coming on the scene imminently, um, since we've been waiting for, uh, since Li Xiangfu's disappearance in, in August, uh, with the lead up to potentially a, a summit between President Biden and, and President Xi at, at APEC, um, does that create the conditions where maybe we're going to see more in the realm of, of more conversations uh, at the military to military level? Uh, yes, I'll say we did receive uh, an invitation to the Shangshan Forum. We have uh, accepted it, and we're going to send participants uh, at a level that's consistent with um, what we've done in the past. Uh, and um, in terms of hopefully kind of kickstarting some of the military to military engagements, uh, uh, yes, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have an opportunity to do that uh, in the coming months. And I would just say the last face-to-face -face meeting, uh, the la in fact, the last discussion that Secretary Austin has had with his PRC counterpart occurred last November uh, during the ADMM Plus uh, meetings uh, then in Cambodia. Uh, those meetings are coming up again next month, and, and we'll look forward to potential opportunities there. The last question I'll ask, I think, has to do with our domestic politics, uh, especially when we're thinking about the U.S. contending again with three theaters. Um, and I'm sure a lot of us that deal with these issues don't need to be convinced that China is a threat, but sometimes we leave D.C. and we go to our, our homes and maybe they're less convinced. Uh, either we have folks that say, you know, this does, I'm not, I don't feel invested in U.S.'s role abroad uh, in conflicts like Ukraine or Israel. Uh, or the opposite, you know, I feel very compelled for the U.S. to be involved in Ukraine and Israel while maybe we're taking our, our eye off Beijing. 
Um, how do you see sort of the role of U.S. government explaining sort of U.S.'s role in these theaters, how to prioritize them, right? Sort of like you're sitting down with your aunt at Thanksgiving. What is sort of the pitch to sort of keep our eye on the prize and what are the implications of this competition long term for your average American? Well, maybe I'll start and then uh, Mike can tell us how he talks to his uh, relatives sure. at Thanksgiving. <laughs> you can warm us up for how you're going to deliver a compelling case on this uh, over Thanksgiving. But look, it is a super important question. Um, I guess, you know, what I would say is I'm relatively encouraged at this point uh, on a couple fronts. Number one, uh, there has emerged a bipartisan consensus on the China challenge. Of course, there are some uh, disagreements around the edges and, and we need to be doing more to work toward a consensus around the solution set to the challenge and that's something that we're working on uh, every day. Um, but it is the case that uh, the, the China issue has not been politicized in the way that other elements of U.S. foreign policy have. That's really important. I think we ought to protect that and preserve that. Every time I go to Capitol Hill, uh, I always make a point of saying, hey, this is really important and, and we do need to protect this from the impulses of uh, partisanship. And, and thankfully, uh, that has been the case. And we see folks on both sides of the aisle uh, talking about this issue uh, in, a, in an important way and in a, in a non-politicized way. And again, we need to preserve that. The other thing I would say is that the public opinion polling has increasingly reflected uh, concern among the American people uh, about the China challenge. So this is not an issue that's foreign to the American people, but you're absolutely right that, that more needs to be done. Uh, and events like this help us do that. So thank you for hosting us today. Uh, but this needs to be an ongoing conversation about uh, what we see as the, as the stakes involved here, which are really important. And, and uh, one of the things you've seen from the Biden administration's national security strategy documents right from the start, including the interim uh, strategy that came out uh, within months of the beginning of the administration was this phrase that has been repeated in the national security strategy and the national defense strategy about China being the only nation in the world with uh, both the will and increasingly the capability to try to refashion the international order in a way that uh, would really have negative implications for the United States. Now, Whitney, you're right. That needs to be translated <laughs> down from, you know, think tank speak down to why does this matter? Uh, for folks living their daily lives, uh, but that is true. It's true in an economic front. It's true to, related to some of the technology issues uh, before, and it's true for uh, the kind of world that, that we want to live in and we want our kids to live in, but, but it's a really uh, important question. Mike, I don't know if you're more. I, think, I guess I would just add that the, the more that this becomes a kind of global problem set for us, uh, the more it becomes clear how the different theaters are interconnected. So uh, sometimes we're asked questions about, well, how are you going to deal with Ukraine and also with the Middle East and also with the um, security in the Indo-Pacific region? And the answer is that we have to deal with all of them and that, in fact, I think that we see uh, growing linkages uh, and so do our allies and partners. I think that's why our European allies and partners uh, in a lot of ways are focusing more on the Indo-Pacific. You see them releasing their own Indo-Pacific strategies. Uh, operating more in the South China Sea and uh, other parts of the region. Uh, and our Indo-Pacific allies and partners likewise have stepped up in a, a pretty big way in some cases for, uh, for the European uh, security uh, situation as well. So I think part of what I would try to explain if this, uh, if this becomes a topic of conversation at Thanksgiving, which uh, you know, remains to be seen, I can report <laughs> back uh, next year when we do this again, but um, would be to emphasize that, uh, that we have to uh, be able to deal with all these situations because they're increasingly interconnected and what happens in one one location has important implications for what uh, is happening or is going to happen in the future in another. Like it. Absolutely. Sounds like a good script for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thank you. I'll write um, it down. <laughs> so we're remarkably almost uh, at time here. So um, I wanted to ask uh, Eli and Mike, you know, if there's anything that we haven't covered today that you think you want folks to know about this report or about what the department's doing on the China challenge um, or one big takeaway that you want uh, the audience uh, to have. Well, uh, I think the, I guess the first thing I would say is, again, if you track the developments over now 20 plus years of these reports, uh, you'll see why uh, the PRC is the pacing challenge. And you've also heard some today about what we're doing about it. Uh, and I think that um, the big takeaway that I would want to leave people with is that we're doing a, a lot about it uh, to make sure that we can sustain and strengthen deterrence. That's not so much the focus of this report. Uh, this report really is about the, the PLA and uh, Chinese foreign policy and security policy 
and how they're using the PLA increasingly as an instrument to advance their goals in those areas. Uh, but uh, we've got a, a lot of uh, a very strong body of work in terms of posture, capabilities, operational concepts, uh, working closely with allies and partners in terms of what we're doing in response. And maybe I would just say, uh, finally, look, this is a congressionally mandated report. It's something we've been doing for uh, uh, 20 years now, but it's also a labor of love for the department. Right. We've got a phenomenal team of analysts who work on this report, and it really is a, a, a Class A product in terms of, from an un unclassified perspective, uh, what can be said about uh, the PLA. It's important for the public. It's important for our partners. We obviously do uh, briefings. We engage with Congress on this report, and it's a terrific resource. And, and for folks out there, I would encourage you to pick up a copy, give it a read, and uh, stay tuned for next year. Yeah. Well, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it really is just an incredible resource to have this open and out there, this authoritative assessment from the Pentagon on China's military power. So congratulations on the report. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Ratner and Dr. Chase for, for joining us um, today to discuss this report. Um, thanks to Whitney McNamara for, for joining me as my co-moderator today. And thanks, for our audience, uh, thanks to our audience for tuning in and for joining the conversation. I uh, hope you have a good rest of your day. All right. Thank you. Thanks. thanks.